Very good. Well, again, welcome back, everyone. And my talk today is going to be brief. Um, it's going to be, however, on a very, very deep topic, despite its brevity. It's going to be a talk in which we will explore what is the nature of God, what is the nature of the absolute. You know, it's interesting how philosophically in Vedic spirituality, in what is called Vedanta, the absolute God is referred to by a very specific name, by a very specific term, Brahman, Brahman. And the reason why this is significant is because in Sanskrit, there are literally thousands of names for God. You know, as someone who has studied Sanskrit for a long time, it never ceases to amaze me how when you compare Sanskrit to other languages, you know, let me give some examples. In English, there's one word for love, love. You can say, I love my wife, I love my car, I love my cat, I love this chocolate ice cream, I love this, I love that, etc., etc., etc. And despite the qualitative difference of the various things that you're saying that you love, you use the same word, love, even though there is indeed a qualitative difference. I love my cat, I love God. <laughs> you use the same word. Even though in actuality what you're describing is uh, a feeling, a sentiment, an emotion on the lower planes, all the way up to the highest states of consciousness, to the point of bhava, to the point of intricate, depthful mellows of expression when we speak about love and devotion toward the divine. We're talking about devotion, the likes of which is so lofty, it's almost unexplainable. And yet, in English, you'll use the same word, love. For that, as you would say, oh, I love my new car. Well, Sanskrit, of course, is extremely different. In Sanskrit, for those things that are recognized as being of true importance, uh, there are often hundreds, if not thousands, of words. So in Sanskrit, for love, there are hundreds of words. For consciousness, there are even more. Again, the things of true importance. Now, when it comes to that which is of highest importance, the absolute, God, God quite literally has thousands and thousands of names in the Sanskrit language. And each one of these names, each one of these words is unique. This is what makes it even more interesting. And in some cases, the differences between one name and another will be so subtle as to seem almost indistinguishable until you fully understand why is one name slightly different from the other and when you explore that difference, you discover that in actuality there is an ocean that is there and the difference was not quite as subtle as you thought. This is um, the immensity of a language that is attempting to describe something that's infinitely beyond even itself as a complex language. And Sanskrit is the most complex language on earth. When we're talking about the absolute, is there really a language at all can, that can describe that absolute? The answer is no. Language is simply a pointer. That's all it is. Like that old adage of the person pointing to the moon, and rather than looking at the beauty of the moon, you're looking at the finger. That's language. The actual content of what is being spoken of, the moon, that's, of, that's what is of importance. Well, it's interesting that in the most philosophically dense portions of the Vedic literature, that is the Upanishads, God is referred to by this term, Brahman. Now, in Sanskrit, uh, as is true for many languages, you have masculine and feminine nouns. This is true in Spanish and Italian and so many different languages. However, interestingly, also in Sanskrit, you have something that you don't have in many other languages. You have the neuter. You have masculine, feminine, and neuter nouns. Brahman is a neuter. It's not pointing to that absolute as either male or female in any context, certainly gender-wise, certainly uh, biologically-wise, but even metaphysical gender, even language gender, which is different. It is pointing to 
God as the absolute, as that which is the source of all things, as that without which there would be nothingness. If we look at the differentiation between being, that is something which is, versus nothingness, something which is not to the point where it is not even aware that it is not. A blackness so deep, a non-existence so deep, that there is not even awareness of the non-existence. When we see that differentiation that is there, this is the designation of God in the philosophical sense as Brahman, that whatever does indeed have being versus its opposite, Abhava, non-being, has its very being itself secured by the very fact of Brahman. Thus, in a way, what this is saying is, yes, indeed, all that there is is Brahman, because without Brahman, nothing else would be. Without God, nothing else would be. This is the magnificence of God, that God is indeed our source. Jamadhyasya Yataha, it says in the Brahma Sutras, which is the most important work on Vedanta philosophy. It gives the definition. What is God? That from which all things proceed. What is that absolute? That from which all things proceed. The perfect definition. So, all that being said, that was just by way of mini introduction <laughs> to what we're actually going to do. What I wanted to do is, with this understanding now of Brahman, of God, of the Absolute, there is a verse in Srimad Bhagavatam that I consider an extremely important verse because it's one of the most philosophical verses explaining precisely what is the nature of this Brahman, what is the nature of God. Yet, interestingly, it's a verse very few people know about, even those individuals who have read the Srimad Bhagavatam extremely well. So what I would like to do is to comment on this verse a little bit, having first read it to everyone. And then you'll understand why the title of this talk is The Absolute Brahman. That's taken from this verse. So let me first read this. This is from the Srimad Bhagavatam, 2nd Canto, chapter 7, verse 47. All right. And this is the verse. What is realized as the absolute Brahman is full of unlimited bliss and without grief. That is certainly the ultimate abode of the Supreme Enjoyer, Bhagavan. He is eternally void of all disturbances and is fearless. He is complete consciousness as opposed to matter. Uncontaminated and without distinctions, he is the principal, primal cause of all causes and effects, in whom there is no sacrifice for fruitive activities, and in whom the illusory energy does not stand. Now, for those individuals who understand Vedanta extremely well, um, for those individuals who have studied Vedanta for years, for those individuals who have studied the works of Shankaracharya, Ramanuja, and Madhva, especially the three greatest Vedantic philosophers, this would be recognized as the perfect verse to explain Vedanta and to explain what is the nature of that Absolute. So the reason why I'm telling you this is when you have a chance when this talk is over, I want you yourselves to look up this verse, read it again, contemplate it, think about it, see true, truthfully how deep this verse is. This is explaining indeed what is the nature of God. You know, it's interesting how unfortunately in the muddled uh, contemporary West. When it comes to important questions, who am I? What is God? What is the path for knowing God? What am I to do? What is my behavior to look like in 
such a manner that I can fulfill what it is that in my deepest essence I was born to do? All these important questions, unfortunately, are extremely muddled in the Western world. Interestingly, however, on this path, nothing is muddled. That sometimes frightens people. <laughs> that we indeed make the claim, very humbly so, actually. Whenever I think about this, I'm humbled <laughs> amazingly by this. That when it comes to a simple question, such as, oh, what is God? And we know that the history of the Western world is that we have had religious denominations literally wage war against each other. We've had fistfights break out in bars over this question. We have had people having debates and contentions, etc., etc., to the point where because there are so many opinions on what is the nature of the absolute, what do many people ultimately end up doing? What is the conclusion that many people come to? Well, due to the multiplicity of opinion alone, it must be the case that there is no answer. Thus, they, became, they become atheists. You know? Oh, what is God? Well, there are so many different people with all their different opinions, uh, so therefore, that in itself must show that there is no such thing as an absolute. There is no such thing as God. And of course, sadly, that is uh, not a logical conclusion to come to. You know, I have one video and I have several books where I talk about this. You know, one plus one equals, all right, one person over here, five. One person over here, 72. Another person over there. One plus one equals a, an elephant. Multiplicity of opinion. Does that mean there is no answer? Of course not. There is an answer. It's an axiomatic answer. It's an answer, the uh, denial of which cannot be sustained. There is an answer. Just because there is a multiplicity of wrong answers does not mean that there isn't a right answer. So, all that being said, let's look at this verse. What is realized as the absolute Brahman is full of unlimited bliss and without grief. This is the very first sentence in describing what is the nature of that which is the source of all being. And how interesting that it starts with this. You know, in the Western world, interestingly, the concept of God is God as doer, God as construction worker, God as engineer. What is God in the Western world? What do we consider to be the highest attribute of the divine? God is creator. God is the person who had the wits about him, the intelligence, the designing skill <laughs> to create. And I can give so many more examples from many different traditions where what is God and a different aspect will be given, but truthfully, lower aspects of the divine. If we think of that which is the source of all things, would we think that the essence of that being is simply that he can make really well, that he can make things really well? Or would it be something actually deeper than that? Well, according to Vedanta, the essence of God is bliss. Not just that he can construct a planet really well, not just that he can do, but that he is. That he is. And what is he? All attractive. He is the center of all reality. Thus, his very essence is that which all beings desire. It's an amazing definition. Think about this. What do all beings desire? A really good construction worker who we can hire on the weekend? What are all beings seeking? All human beings, every animal, every plant, they're seeking bliss. This is why when you have a house plant, over a period of weeks, you will see that houseplant lean toward the sun. That is its bliss. When you watch ants walking around, you know, just walking around with as much energy as they have, searching, 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 what are they searching for? They're searching for their bliss, in the form of crumbs, and on and on and on. Human beings, you know, you probably see that here in Austin, here in Austin, probably more than almost anywhere in America, except for maybe New York, which is where I'm from, 
human beings are all frantically searching for their bliss. Of course, sadly, often in the wrong ways, they think their bliss consists of a better career and a better job and more money and a better car and a better mate and this and that material object which once attained does not satisfy them ultimately. But they're, search, they're searching for bliss. Thus, what is the very first definition of the absolute that is given in the very first sentence of this verse? Again, it's a perfect verse. What is realized as the absolute Brahman is full of unlimited bliss and without grief. Without grief. This is why you'll remember at one point yesterday when I was speaking, I explained how the term for no anxiety is Vaikuntha. Vaikuntha. This literally means no anxiety. And Vaikuntha also is the name of the spiritual realm. Quite literally, the seat of God is that place without anxiety, without grief. See, the mirror opposite of bliss. So, that which we wish to avoid, grief, that which we were born seeking, and every being seeks, bliss. That is the nature of this Absolute. Thus, everything that we desire, everything that we're looking for, and not just consciously, not just verbally, but more, deeply unconsciously, is there in that Absolute for us to know. Imagine this. Sounds like magic almost. Imagine if someone were to come to you and say, oh yes, you know, here, here is a little box, and when you open it will be everything that your deepest heart has always desired, and more, every suffering, every fear, every anxiety, every grief that you know upon opening this box will cease as if it never even existed. But just imagine. That is actually the definition of God. This is why, for all of eternity, individuals have sought that absolute. Yogis, sages, saints, philosophers of the, in the true sense of that term, have sought that absolute. Why? Because that is what that absolute is. Anandam, unlimited bliss. So, let's go on. That is certainly the ultimate abode of the Supreme Enjoyer, Bhagavan. So, again, for those individuals who understand the nature of, uh, of Vedanta, the history of Vedanta, the ver various philosophical uh, propositions of Vedanta, this is making very clear that, now going a little bit deeper, all right, we understand. That absolute is bliss, that absolute is the opposite of grief, the end of grief. But more, that absolute is also personal. That absolute is indeed a person. Now, how do we know this? In the second verse, in the second sentence, it uses a very specific term for this absolute. See, now we have left Brahman, this more impersonal aspect of the absolute, behind. Now we are speaking of God under a different name, Bhagavan the personal aspect of God. And more, it is saying here in this verse that this absolute has an ultimate abode. It doesn't name that ultimate abode, but in other scriptures, of course, we know what is the name of that ultimate abode. That ultimate abode is the term I used before, Vaikuntha. So now it's specifying even more. All right, not just what is that absolute, See, that's the first sentence. Now the second sentence. Who is that absolute? Who is that absolute? Let's go on. He is eternally void of all disturbances and is fearless. Eternally. Now we add another element. You see, not simply substantial being, but now within the context of what in the, in the material world we would recognize as time, but in actuality is beyond time, the eternal. Thus, to say 
let's say that going back to that box analogy. All right, here's a little box, and when you open it, you will have supreme bliss and your grief will end. That in itself would be pretty amazing, no? However, what was the element that was left out? For how long? All right, oh, wonderful. Oh, yes, uh, I am interested in that. Let me open the box. Yes, indeed, supreme bliss. Oh, my grief has ended. Oh, wait a minute, it's back. No. This verse now makes it very clear. Eternally. So, eternally, this is the nature of the absolute. Now, let's go on. And um, it may not seem this way, but I'm actually going extremely fast with this verse, only because, uh, and it's my fault, we have a little bit less time than I thought we would. But let's go on a little bit more. He is complete consciousness as opposed to matter. Now, this is, this is code. This in itself actually could almost be seen as a sutra if this were uh, isolated, this one sentence as a verse in and of itself. Consciousness versus matter. In other words, that which has the properties of consciousness versus that which has the properties of matter. Let's start with the latter. What are the properties of matter? Well, the properties of matter are A, that any material thing that you can analyze, it doesn't matter what, any material thing that you can analyze isn't perfect. Isn't perfect. You can go to the most sophisticated, most sophisticated laboratory conceivable, and they can create, let's say, a little, a little uh, metallic block that was quite literally created by lasers, laser precision, and to the point where you look at it, you examine it with the naked eye, and it looks like the proportions, everything is perfect. It's so smooth, you could almost uh, cut glass with it, etc. However, if you were to analyze it closer under a microscope and continue getting closer and closer, eventually you would begin to see imperfections in that object. It doesn't matter how perfect something seems in this world. Analyze it long enough, you will find its flaws. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. So, A, everything that is material is imperfect, is flawed in one way or another. B, everything that is material is by designation disintegrating. Disintegrating. See? Because it's close to me. Stable. Solidity. It's disintegrating right now as we are sitting here. Will this be here in 100,000 years? It will have ceased to exist probably 99,000 years before that. It's disintegrating. This room is disintegrating. Anything that is material is indeed disintegrating. That is its nature. Thus, internally, the internal structure of anything that is material is necessarily temporal. And that leads to C. Anything that is material is temporal. That is, you can grasp it temporarily. You can claim, claim that you own it temporarily. However, regardless of anything, in time, it will be gone. What is your prized possession now, in time, no longer will be. Guaranteed. If only because, uh, if only because you won't even outlast it. <laughs> you know, I've constructed a beautiful home, let's say, beautiful home, beautiful mansion. Well, it may have been constructed extremely well to the point where in 500 years, maybe it'll still be here, but I won't. <laughs> Temporal. Now, that, those are some of the properties of matter. Truthfully, I can go on. What is the property of God? What is the inner essence of God? What is that of which, to use very, very flawed English, that of which God is made, is constructed? What is the essence of God? Consciousness. 
And to state this again very quickly, because we only have limited time, what is the property of consciousness? What is its nature? The very opposite of everything that I said about materiality. It is unflawed. It is quite literally perfect. If you could, and it's an oxymoron, you can't, but if you could somehow view consciousness through the most powerful microscope on earth, first, before even the microscope, looking at it with the bare eyes, it would seem perfect. Looking at it through the most powerful microscope, it would seem perfect. Now, find a microscope infinitely greater than that, it is still perfect. And you can go on eternally in this way. Perfection means perfection not simply perfection to the eyes, you know, and on and on. I'm not going to go through this whole list. You have the idea. Thus, what is the nature of God? Consciousness, the perfect. Let's go on. All right. Uncontaminated and without distinctions. Uncontaminated. What is meant by that? What is contamination? What is contamination? It means something introduced into an element that is not meant to be there and that is damaging to that element. The Absolute has nothing like this. There is nothing that threatens, in other words, the Absolute. The Absolute being the Absolute. And without distinctions. And without distinctions. That the Absolute is a unitary being. A unitary being. There is no distinction in the Absolute meaning that uh, God is one. God is not multiple. God is not made of parts. Anything made of parts necessarily disintegrates, necessarily is flawed because it's dependent upon its parts. God has no parts, thus has no dependency. God is the ultimate independent. All right. And again, I apologize. I'm going through this quickly, but we'll try to leave some time for some questions. He is the principal, primal cause of all causes and effects. So again, Jan, Jan Madhyasya Yataha, as it says in the Brahma Sutras, that God is the source of all things. And more, um, another very philosophical term in Sanskrit, a definition of God is karana karanam. That is, that which is the cause of all causes and yet in itself has no cause. Okay? Let's go on just a little bit deeper. And in whom there is no sacrifice for fruitive activities. So in other words, everything that God does is motivated not by selfishness. There is no selfishness in God. There is no egotism in God. While this may seem uh, self-explanatory and obvious, still, the, the scripture decided to say this to juxtapose what it means to be egoless versus having ego. Very simply. All right. And we're getting toward the end. And, and I love this part actually because of how it's stated very emphatically. And in whom the illusory energy does not stand. So, in other words, um, you know, we put out a video about two months ago of a talk that I gave that was talking about non-dualism and personality and how, yes, it is impossible for God to fall under illusion. Thus, if we make the mistaken idea, uh, if we make the mistaken statement as is done in Advaita and so-called non-dualism that well, we're all God. We are God. I'm God. Uh, I'm just an illusion now because, well, I've forgotten God. And what does it mean to make spiritual progress? It means to remember the fact that I am perfect. It means to remember the fact that I'm actually omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, omnicompetent, and that I am God. Oh, yes, I am God. Well, no, you're not. Because you're an illusion. And God does not fall under illusion. If God were to fall under illusion, then what you are saying is God is flawed. What you're saying is there is something more powerful than God. You see, if handcuffs were to be put on me, why am I bound? Because the handcuffs are stronger than me. I can try to break them. I am not strong enough. 
So if we say that, oh yes, I am God, I am just presently an illusion, what we are saying is that I am like that God is that person with handcuffs on. There's something stronger than him that he cannot break. And at that moment, by very definition, we are not talking about God. We are not talking about what? Now, full circle. We are not talking about what? We are not talking about God, Gott, is that the German? Yeah. yeah. Brahman, which is, what's the translation? Hmm? No, no. <laughs> huh? The Absolute. Remember the title of this talk? <laughs> the Absolute. Thus, again, we see the contradiction in saying the Absolute is not the Absolute. If we say that, oh yes, you know, I am God, uh, but I'm presently uh, just an illusion, I've forgotten that I am God, so my goal is to remember that I am God, by definition, then, you're saying the Absolute is not the Absolute, that there is something more powerful than the Absolute. Well, by definition, that's an impossibility, then you're not talking about the Absolute. It's kind of like, oh, I came in fifth place in the beauty pageant. I'm the winner of the beauty pageant. I was voted the best, but I came in fifth place. <laughs> By definition, that's not the best. In the same way, if you say that the absolute can be controlled by something less than the absolute, by definition, that lesser thing is actually the absolute. Thus, what you're saying is illusion is absolute because it's more powerful than God. This is why Advaita falls apart. This is why the claim that many new agey types make that, oh yes, we're all God, we've just forgotten, crumbles. Like not only a house of cards, but a house of cards that never even existed. So this verse makes this very clear in this very last cause. What is, what is that absolute Brahman? That being in whom the illusory energy does not stand. In other words, in comparison to, to Brahman, illusion does not exist. Not only can illusion not overtake that absolute, in the face of the absolute, illusion does not even exist. It has no being. This is worth knowing. This is worth knowing. This is worth experiencing. This is why we practice yoga. Good. Uh, what you're talking about, uh, that doesn't depend on any part of God, is that what you're saying? That actually that God does not have parts. By definition, God does not have parts. Okay. So, um, so the attributes of God, that, how would you describe that? This is, this is one with God? Those are, those are uh, of God, they do not compose God. That's the difference. You know, we can have attributes, but uh, we're, we are not dependent upon our attributes. So, very simple examples. Uh, one of, you could say, my attributes. Uh, oh, I have, uh, you know, long brown hair. Okay, yes, that's an attribute. Am I dependent upon that? Can I choose to shave my head? And would I cease to be me? Would, would my essential being be so, uh, so altered to the point where I would no longer be me? No, of course not. So attributes are, are different from parts. Uh, now, what's an example of a part? My heart. So you can shave my head off, I'm fine. Remove my heart, oh, I'm no longer fine. The heart is not an attribute. The heart is an essential part. So God does not have parts in that sense. God has attributes, that is, things uh, that he, let's say, powers that he chooses to have that give his personality expression but he is not dependent on them the attributes are dependent on him 
And even if he didn't have those attributes, his essential being would remain the same. Does that make sense? Very good. Please. Can everything that exists be divided into the matter and consciousness? Yes. So is consciousness God? Good question. Uh, consciousness can be understood either in the more general of senses as an on, what's called an ontological category of being, or it could be understood uh, in its various modes. So it depends on what you mean by consciousness. You know. So in other words, uh, you know, to, to make that a little simpler, you can say water or you can say uh, Lake Michigan. If you're saying water, well, then you're speaking of all water. But if you say Lake Michigan, you're speaking about a very specific body with its own attributes, with its own history, et cetera, et cetera. If you say that uh, Lake Michigan is water, you would be correct. If you say that water is Lake Michigan, you would be incorrect. You see the difference. In the same way, if you're speaking about uh, consciousness in the most general of senses, all consciousness has God as its source, because God is the origin of all consciousness. But at this, <coughs> the origin of matter. Yes, God is the origin of matter as well. God is the origin of everything. Yeah. So, uh, in a higher sense, both, interestingly, are seen as uh, energies of the divine. It's only when you are in illusion that actually you see that distinction as being a radical distinction that. You know, uh, oh, matter is as radically distinct from consciousness as anything can be. But when you're liberated, you see both of them as still being distinct, but as being energies of the, of the divine. This is why a person who achieves liberation has the ability to operate as pure consciousness within the material world, and to them, even the material world is itself God's kingdom. For a person in illusion, materiality has the ability to ensnare them and entrap them. So the examples I gave before, oh, they're attracted to some car they want, or they're attracted to wealth, material things. For a person, on the other hand, who has liberation, they can also own a car. They can also have some money. They can also have the exact same material things as the person in illusion. But their relationship to those material things is different because they understand even those material things as ultimately having God as their source. Yeah. Is, is the mind matter or is it consciousness? It's matter. Interestingly, it's, it's matter. Yeah. Uh, in fact, let me give you uh, the short list of what is matter versus what is consciousness. And this actually surprises people sometimes because often things that we uh, a tribute to consciousness actually aren't. Uh, and this is especially a problem in, in the Western world. But these are the things that are categorized as matter. And I'll start from the grossest and to the subtlest. So, uh, and in fact, I'll go even further. Dealing with the person, make it very personal. So, physicality, the body, material, going up a little bit more. Emotions, material, up a little bit more in subtlety. Uh, in qualitative, subtle distinction. Uh, mind, what is called manas in Sanskrit, is considered material, going up a little bit more. Intellect is considered to be material. And then finally, the subtlest of things, uh, ego, ahankara, ego, that is false identity, is the subtlest aspect of materiality, but it's matter nonetheless. And then finally, what is consciousness? Consciousness is that element that transcends all the above. So God is consciousness. Each, each living being in their deepest essence is also consciousness. Now, this is what's fascinating. So you saw that, that little pyramid that I created, that little hierarchical distinction, starting with physical body all the way to consciousness proper, consciousness itself. Now, this is the thing that is interesting, as I was saying before. For the liberated yogi, it's not that upon liberation and understanding that, well, in actuality, what I am is that consciousness. It's not that they now see all these other things as 
uh, let's say, enemies or something I must reject or something that's evil, etc. No, on the contrary. This is a, the thing that is fascinating. Upon achieving enlightenment, liberation, of course, you still have these things. You still have a physical body. You still have a mind. You still have intellect, etc. However, it is only now that all of these things now properly understood within their proper context and being freed from their influence. That is, rather than them mastering you, now you are mastering them. It is only now that you can use these things perfectly. Perfectly. This is why the perfected yogi actually is more beautiful than a materialistic person who wears a ton of makeup. This is why the liberated yogi has more wisdom than the greatest professor with three PhDs. This is why the liberated yogi, and I can go on and on, has a mind that is crystal clear and that is unagitated. Whereas even the most intelligent person often has a very agitated mind. And if you were to tell even a very intelligent person, let's say some scholar, all right, I want you to sit for one hour and focus on this sound. This sound is the name of God. As you do this, no other thought, no other feeling, nothing must encroach upon that sound in even the smallest or the subtlest, subtlest of ways. If you were to give even the most intelligent scholar this task, if they are lucky, they'd be able to accomplish it for 15 seconds. Whereas the yogi can do that effortlessly. So, in other words, the thing that is the most amazing, uh, almost paradox in this, is that it is when you become a liberated being that you bring the body, the emotions, the mind, the intellect, etc., etc., to its perfection. This is why we are called to become true yogis. And this is why a true yogi is not scared of that, what has become a terrible word, perfection. I don't know if that answers your question, but I hope it does. And yeah, we are consciousness. Om Namo Narayana Om Namo